Radiation. The most terrifying killer you'll never see. It doesn't roar like a lion or strike like lightning. It doesn't even whisper. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't hear it coming. And yet, it can rewrite your DNA in seconds. One breath in the wrong place, one minute too long in the wrong room, and your cells begin unraveling from the inside out. This killer leaves no trace, no footprints, no bloodstains, just a slow collapse of the body that can take days, months, or years to reveal itself. Tonight, we travel into the world's most radioactive places, zones so dangerous that five minutes of exposure could deliver a lifetime's worth of radiation in a single breath. But this isn't just a story about physics. It's about psychology, about how humans react when confronted with an invisible enemy, why we're drawn to places we should run from, why glowing dust can feel like magic instead of death. To understand the ghost that kills, we have to start with the story of the people who trusted it most and paid the price with their bones. The year is 1917. The world is at war, and a new miracle substance has captured the imagination of America. Radium. It glows in the dark. It's painted on watch dials, airplane instruments, even toys. Advertisements promise it will restore vitality and bring endless energy. In factories, young women are hired to paint watch faces with glowing numbers. Their brushes are fine, so fine they sharpen the tips with their lips. Lick, paint, dip, lick, paint, dip. A rhythm that becomes a death march. The paint tastes sweet, almost like sugar. But each lick delivers a dose of radiation thousands of times stronger than an x-ray. At first, the women feel energized. They laugh about glowing faintly in the dark after their shifts. They're called the Ghost Girls, a nickname that feels playful, until their teeth begin to rot, until their jaws begin to break, until tumors blossom from their bones. The tragedy of the Radium Girls is more than a horror story of slow poisoning. It's a psychological case study of what happens when blind faith in progress blinds us to danger. The glowing paint wasn't just a product. It was a symbol of modernity. And when culture tells us that progress is safe, we silence our instincts. Every dial they painted became a countdown clock, not for soldiers in the trenches, but for the women themselves. And their story isn't isolated because decades later, Another silent killer still waits in the basement of a hospital built for the workers of Chernobyl. In 1986, the Chernobyl disaster created one of the deadliest radioactive zones in human history. The firefighters and workers who rushed in wore simple clothes, cotton uniforms, rubber boots. When radiation soaked into those fabrics, the garments became hotter than the reactor itself. Those clothes were carried to the basement of Hospital 126 in Pripyat. They remain there today, piled in heaps, still emitting up to 3,000 Rankins per hour, enough radiation to kill a person in 10 minutes. The silence of that basement is more haunting than the glowing reactor core itself. Why? Because unlike the crumbling sarcophagus of the reactor, this room is ordinary. A hallway, a door, a pile of laundry, but step too close, and the invisible storm begins. So, why are we drawn to such places? Why do tourists still break into exclusion zones, cameras in hand, knowing they risk their health for a glimpse of something forbidden? Psychologists call it the forbidden fruit effect. When a place is declared deadly, curiosity amplifies. We don't just want to know about it. We want to stand in the shadow of danger to test if the rules apply to us. But if Chernobyl is a monument to human error, Japan hides a different kind of radioactive ghost, one where time itself stopped ticking. When the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant melted down in 2011, the nearby town of Naimi was evacuated within hours. Time froze. Clock stopped. Supermarket shelves still hold expired food. Laundry still hangs on lines. Children's toys sit abandoned in schoolyards waiting for hands that will never return. Unlike Chernobyl, where Soviet secrecy delayed evacuations, Naimi's residents were rushed out almost instantly. And yet, more than a decade later, many refused to come back. Not because of radiation levels, but because of the psychology of betrayal. In Japan, 
there's a phrase, Shikata GA9. It cannot be helped. Earthquakes, tsunamis, typhoons, nature is relentless, and people accept it. But when technology fails, when the machines we built to protect us turn against us, that's different. In the West, it feels like betrayal. In Japan, too, the bond of trust was broken. Nami is more than a contaminated town. It's a monument to what happens when faith in technology shatters. But not every radioactive ghost hides behind fences and warning signs. Sometimes, paradise itself conceals the deadliest secret of all. Imagine a ring of emerald islands floating in the endless turquoise of the Pacific. White sand beaches glow under the sun. Coconut palms sway in the wind. This is Bikini Atoll, a paradise. But paradise here comes with a mushroom cloud. Between 1946 and 1958, the U.S. detonated 23 nuclear weapons on and around Bikini. Some blasts were so powerful, they vaporized entire islands. The people of Bikini called the Atoll their everything place, where they fished, prayed, and buried their ancestors. Now, their ancestors' graves glow in the dark, too radioactive for flowers. Today, the beaches look perfect, birds will overhead, waves sparkle, palms sway. But the soil carries poison. Coconut crabs still absorb cesium. The lagoon hides plutonium fragments. Tourists sometimes visit, lured by the beauty. But the locals, displaced for generations, remain in exile. Their paradise is poisoned. And if paradise can kill, what about danger that doesn't even hide? What about danger that shines like a star in your hand? Los Alamos, 1945. The birth of the atomic age. Scientists worked with plutonium cores so radioactive they could kill in seconds. Yet some felt confident enough to push the limits, performing experiments with bare hands. They called it tickling the dragon's tail. The goal, bring a plutonium core to the edge of criticality, then pull back. Get too close, and the dragon wakes, unleashing a burst of radiation hot enough to burn through flesh and bone. One experiment went too far. A screwdriver slipped. The core flashed blue with Cherenkov radiation, light produced when particles travel faster than the speed of light in that material. Beautiful, deadly. The scientist, Harry Daglian, died weeks later. His body failed organ by organ, cell by cell. Why risk such experiments? Psychologists call it the illusion of control. We believe our expertise shields us. That danger bends to confidence. But radiation doesn't care about confidence. And while some dangers came from reckless curiosity, others were disasters so vast, entire villages vanished. Not just from memory, but from maps. They tried to erase. Not all danger is born in secret labs. Sometimes a disaster is so vast that entire villages are not just evacuated, but erased entirely, not from memory, but from maps. In 1957, the Soviet Union's Mayak facility suffered a massive explosion, a nuclear disaster second only to Chernobyl. Families woke to soldiers at their doors. Pack one bag. Leave now. Don't ask questions. Children left toys. Mothers left gardens half-planted. People never returned. Their homes were bulldozed. Villages were literally painted out of maps, as if they never existed. This wasn't just erasure of land. It was erasure of identity. Imagine your hometown vanishing so completely that even road signs deny it ever stood. The danger wasn't only radiation. It was the psychological trauma of invisibility. To be told, your life, your history, your roots, gone. But radiation doesn't just erase villages. Sometimes, it lures people with beauty, offering death in the form of glowing dust. Brazil, 1987. Two men scavenged a radiotherapy machine from an abandoned clinic in Goiânia. Inside, they found a capsule of cesium-137. When they cracked it open, a strange blue powder spilled out. It glowed in the dark. Magical. Beautiful. Neighbors gathered to see it. Children played with it. One family thought it was a blessing, a gift from heaven. They rubbed it on their skin. Six-year-old Leda Das Nevis Ferreira ate a sandwich with cesium-dusted fingers. 
Within days, she was vomiting blood. She died 28 days later. So radioactive, she had to be buried in a lead line coffin. The glowing dust spread through homes, streets, markets. Hundreds were contaminated. The city was paralyzed by fear. Psychologists call this the familiarity bias. When something looks beautiful, familiar, or harmless, our brains downplay the risk. But the blue powder was no blessing. It was death disguised as starlight. And it forces us to ask, how will future generations view the dangers we leave behind? Deep under the rock of Finland lies Onkelo, the world's first permanent nuclear waste repository. Inside are tunnels designed to hold radioactive waste for 10,000 years, longer than all recorded human history. Engineers carved warning symbols into the walls, skulls, screaming faces, figures running. The hope is to frighten future generations away. But history offers a cruel paradox. Every warning becomes an invitation. Archaeologists flock to tombs marked do not enter. Treasure hunters are drawn to sealed caves. Can we really design a warning that will last 400 generations? Or will Onkelo become the world's most dangerous time capsule? A tomb that tempts instead of Dieters? And if the danger of the future is misunderstanding, the danger of the present is perception itself. We just walked through glowing workshops and silent towns. We've stood in paradise, poisoned by bombs, and watched children play with dust that killed them. But here's the truth. Radiation is not the greatest killer in our world. Every day, 1,300 people die from smoking. More in a single day than all nuclear accidents in 70 years combined. And yet, most of us would rather walk past a smoker than past a building with a radiation symbol. The real ghost isn't radiation itself. The real ghost is in our perception. We fear what we can't see, what we can't understand. And in that fear, radioactive places become mirrors, reflecting not just invisible danger, but the fragile psychology of being human. So the question remains, do these danger zones terrify us or do they tempt us? Because sometimes the most dangerous places on earth are the ones we can't resist.